want you to turn in your Bibles with me this morning to the first book of John. The first John. It's not the Gospel of John. It's those three little books towards the end of your Bible. First John, second John, third John. I want you to go to first John. Chapter 1, verse 1. One of my, my favorite preaching scriptures when I'm traveling and I'm in the mission field and I'm preaching to the unsaved. I know I'm preaching to the saved this morning, but I don't know because I only see your hands and your smiley face and I can't see your heart. Um, the Bible says only God knows the heart. Amen. So I don't know whether you've given your life to Jesus. I don't know whether you've received the forgiveness of your sins. You may just like coming to church. And I'll tell you what, there's churches all around the world where people are this morning who just like going to church. And they like the fellowship and the community. But Jesus is still way out there somewhere. They haven't drawn him in close to them and received the forgiveness of their sin. And uh, so there'd be many people like that in, our, in churches today. And there could be someone like that in, in this church. Normally on Sunday morning, I think I'm preaching to the choir because you sounded good today. Like as I'm you're like, just sitting out singing and it felt like there was 10,000 people behind me. And uh, singing, especially that, that last song. And uh, singing about the old rugged cross. And it was just absolutely wonderful. I want to say this morning that before I'm just going to read a few verses from John, 1 John chapter 1 and from verse 1. John is preaching the testimony of the saved to the unsaved. Right? I here because if this is a letter and it's going to be read out in churches, it's going to be read in different places, but like John, like me. He don't know who's saved and who's not saved. And there's some, there's some major issues in the early church. Did you know that? People were coming in with all different sorts of issues and problems. And the same today. You know, people are coming out of different denominations where the thought of salvation may be different to what the scripture says. And they're coming in thinking that their good works save them. Your good works don't save you. And, uh, and they've got different ideas about who Jesus is and, and what Jesus has done. And John says, he starts off, that which was from the beginning. <laughs> he's talking about the Son of God. He's talking about the Word of God. He's talking about Jesus. But then um, they only knew Jesus since he was born of Mary. So he was Jesus. But before he was born of Mary, he is the Son of God. He was the Christ. He was Yahshua in the Old Testament. We talked about this the other week. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. John is, listen to what John says. You know, I've spoken this many times. He's, he's talking to these people. He's writing to these people. And he's saying that which was from the beginning. Remember in the gospel of John in chapter 1. He says, and in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Margaret said, and Jesus is God this morning at your communion. He's the Lord. He's God Almighty. That we have heard. Oh, they've heard Jesus. He's heard. Which we have, he's saying we, which we have heard. He's talking about the, the saved this morning. Because you have to hear Jesus if you're saved. Like which we have seen with our eyes. Which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. Concerning who? The word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and we bear witness and what we declare to you. He's writing to someone. And we know that he's thinking these people may not be saved who I'm writing to. So he's saying all this I know about the testimony of the saved I'm sharing with you. I'm declaring to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. He's saying, because we're saved, was manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. And that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full also. So if you have what we have, this is the saved talking to the unsaved. If you have what we have, you will have fellowship with Him also. 
You can have this fellowship and this joy that Jesus brings into your life. You can have that too. All you need to do is come to Christ. Because there was some, a lot of issues going on in the church and there's still issues going on in today's church. And, and it's amazing. See, he said like, I think every point that I have today to share with you came out either in the songs or in the communion. It was, it was amazing. I'm like, and I'm always looking for confirmation because I, I know, know my issues and my problems of long. Oh, is it? Oh, is it? I don't, I don't need that. You can hear me, can't you? I'm a preacher. And so, oh, hallelujah. Just, I forgot where I was. <laughs> Everything, ever, rewind. <laughs> Everything that I wanted to preach, and I always look for confirmation. I'm always looking for confirmation because I'm human, right? And and I know that I made mistakes, and and although the word of God is in my heart, and I, and this is what I believe God wants me to preach, I'm, I'm always looking for confirmation. Lord, make sure I'm on the right track. Lord, this is about you, not about me. This is about your word, not about what I want to share. Oh my goodness, if I shared what I wanted to share, you'd be in trouble. But see, God is compassionate. Amen. He's good. And so always he gives me confirmation that I'm on the right track. What John was saying was we know him because he's touched us. And we've touched him. And this is the, my message. I wanted to title my message this morning. So I've titled it, The Touch of God. The Touch of God. John had been touched by God. The only way to be touched by God is to put yourself in a place to be touched by God. Like uh, Margaret mentioned, the woman with the hemorrhage of blood this, this morning. She was actually in her house and Jesus was walking through town. He, if she had stayed in the house, he'd have kept walking and she would never have been touched by God. And she said she wanted to touch him. But it wasn't her touching him that healed her. It was him touching her. Because when she, she thought in her mind, if I just touch him, I will be healed. So she touched him and he turned around and he said, who touched me? Listen. And the disciples said to him, what do you mean, master? We're in a throng of people. Everyone's touching you. Did everyone get healed? No. He said, but someone touched me and I felt power come out from me. And so the power of God went in to her and brought healing to her life. See, we need to be touched by God. We need to touch God also, but we need to be touched by God. See, Matthew, to get in a position to be touched by God, for John to be able to say this in Matthew 4, uh, verse 21, it actually talks about how Jesus came and called John and he left his fishing business. He left his father and his fishing business and he left everything behind to follow Jesus. See, sometimes people of God, the reason that we don't receive what we believe from God is because we got too much other stuff going on in our lives which is choking us and these are the cares of the world and the thoughts of the world and we're doing too much of this stuff I'm not saying that you've got to leave your business I'm not saying that you've got to leave your employment I'm not saying that you've got to leave your father and mother or your wife and children and follow God all right but in your heart yes you've got to give it all to Jesus you've got to give it all to Jesus see some can only share pick up the Bible and they share the gospel according to John. Oh, did you know it says in the book of John that unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. And do you know it says in the book of John that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. Do you know that it says in, you're sharing the gospel according to John? But when Jesus has touched you, you can share the gospel according to you. Amen. Because yeah. then you can start to see us sharing. The Word of God is great. There's nothing wrong with the Word of God. The Word of God is perfect. The Word of God, you can share the Word of God. Please, please, please share the Word of God. But when you can give a personal testimony, see, no one can change the miracle that's happened in your life. Yeah. When you say, well, I know God is real. How do you know God is real? Because He touched me. Yeah. Because He healed me. Yeah. Because He 
Don't owe this to me. And they go, oh, I don't believe it. I don't care if you believe it. I believe it because it happened to me. See, we need to share the gospel according to us when God has touched our lives. Amen. When you've been touched by God, I want to tell you today that the touch of God, what the touch of God does for us. And you can check to see if God has touched your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Number one, I'm going to use five points and I'm going to use the word touch. And a lot of preachers do this and I think I'm always excited when they do this and I wonder how they do this, but I've done it. Okay. I don't often do this. I have points sometimes and uh, I don't preach many sermons with no point. Okay. Yep, my sermons have got a point. Okay. At least one point or the point. So number one, T of touch is the word transform. This is what the word of God does to us. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If any man be where? In Christ. In Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. <laughs> when you came to Jesus oh, and, and you gave your life to Jesus and you received by faith and repentance the new life in Christ, you're not you anymore. Oh, you look like you, but you ain't you. Because the real you is not the person you look at in the mirror. When you look at the person in the mirror, it's like looking for a new home. Oh, I'd like to look at that one. That's better than mine. And you look in the mirror and you still see you. You're only looking at your hands. Well, what Paul says, you're the tent that you live in. The real you is the spirit you on the inside. See, when you got born again, your flesh didn't get born again. It's your spirit got born again. Amen. That's where the transformation happened, and it happens from the inside out. It's a bit like, have you ever heated a pie up in the microwave? And you put it in, and, uh, and you get it out, and you pick it up, and it don't feel very hot, but you bite it and you burn all your mouth, right? Because it's heated up on the inside, and, uh, and it's working inside out. And I always burn my mouth from pies that I put in the microwave. And so that's how God works on us. He comes and changes us on the inside. He transforms us. I, love that. I could spend a month on every point of this, but I'm not going to. See, Paul, who wrote that, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He was qualified to preach this because he knew. See, he was preaching the gospel according to what Jesus had done in him. Yeah. See, most of you would know Paul's story. He was a Pharisee and he persecuted the way or the church or the people of Jesus and he thought he was doing God a big favor oh he's serving God I'm going to take those Christians and I'm going to lock them up and I'm going to feed them to the lions and I'm going to do I'm going to kill them because they're standing in the way of the real God no he didn't know Jesus but remember he was on his way to Damascus to get some more Christians and remember the light that shone and uh, knocked him down and blinded him for three days he was blinded and uh, he, he went from this highly qualified, highly educated man to a person that had to be led into town by somebody's hand. How low can you go? That's one of my lines in my Christmas concert. So I'm learning my Christmas concert lines already. He was very, and you can read this, I won't go to these scriptures, but you can read in Philippians 3 and Acts 22, where Paul ad, ad, lays out his qualifications and his education. You know, raised under Gamaliel, the, the high priest, you know, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, born of the, the, the tribe of Benjamin. You know, he was a Jew and he was proud of it, but he spoke... Hebrew, Greek, and in Latin, and he spoke all these different languages, you know. And uh, he was an amazing man because you know he spoke different languages because when they heard him speak in Hebrew, oh my goodness, he's a Jew. Paul was highly qualified, qualification, education, but he had not yet had transformation. And that's what held him back. See, many people who come into the church, they're highly qualified and they're highly educated. 
but they haven't been saved and they haven't been transformed yet by the power of the Holy Ghost through salvation. And they sit there and they critique my message. And that's good. I don't mind that. You can critique me as much as you want because I'm not highly qualified and I'm not highly educated, but I'm highly transformed Amen. by Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's what we need more than anything. There's nothing wrong with qualifications. They're good. There's nothing wrong with being highly educated. It's good. But unless we're highly transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, we're, we're, we're stuck behind the eight ball all the time. And, uh, but he wants this transformation. Listen, we don't need more education or more qualification. We need transformation. I mean, you've heard that many times. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John came before the, the courts, I love this scripture. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, these were pretty much uneducated fishermen. Right? They perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled. Why? Because they realized they had been with Jesus. They realized they had been touched and transformed by Jesus. What is it that these... These men don't know anything, but listen to them. And when the, when the Pharisees heard Jesus teach, no one has taught like this before. And he's imparted that into your life through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The touch of God brings forgiveness of sins to those who repent and believe. It brings cleansing and power to those who yield completely to God. The transforming touch of God makes everything new. He said, you're a new creation. Everything new. New life in Christ, new desires, new heart, the Bible says, new hope. And there's people here today saying, yeah, I want this new life. I don't know whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. You could be a Christian stuck in that rut. But you want something something to happen in your life. You, this is, you want this new life. You want this... Uh, abundance of new life that Jesus you said I want a new start I need some joy in my life you just said pastor that, that and the joy of God will come into my life I don't have this joy I want this joy you can have it today Amen. this morning you can have it I wish I had this new life you can today and you can ask Jesus to forgive you and uh, not maybe to get born again again because you're already born again but you can Rededicate to the Lord today. And you can feel that, you know, the, Peter says, he says that we may repent and believe and the refreshing of the Lord will come upon you. I, I don't know, sometimes I need refreshing and I go to Jesus. In fact, every day with Jesus becomes a new day. Every day is a new day. For today is all we have, right? <laughs> Yesterday's gone, I ain't coming back. And tomorrow actually never comes. Today, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, is the day of salvation. In Hebrews 3, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice and do not harden your heart. And in Hebrews 11, it says, Now faith is. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. Now faith is. Amen. Stop worrying about yesterday. And I'm talking to people here today. And stop fantasizing about tomorrow. Live today. It could be your last. Amen. Jesus could come back today. <laughs> Glory to God. It's okay to dream and have a vision, right? But many live in the past or the future at the expense of today. And never do anything. I will when. When my kids are growing up, then I will. When they're out of nappies, then I will. When they're out of school, then I will. When they're out of the home, then I will. Oh, I used to remember 25 years ago when I used to serve the Lord. I used to feed the hungry in the park. And oh, when I used to do this and when I used to do that. I hear a lot of that. And then I will, I will, I used to, I used to. What are you doing today? What are you doing today for God? Today is the only day you have. Because when you get to tomorrow, it becomes today. Okay. And that's why people live in tomorrow. They never do anything. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me move on. So we've been transformed by the touch of God. Amen. And let me, there's this word that I want to use today for the O. It's called ordain. 
ordained. Oh Lord, Jesus. John 15, 16. And it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And the King James Version says, And ordained you that you should go and bear fruit. The New King James says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. I like that word for the whole congregation because we get we get hooked up and hung up on this word ordained because our oh, pastor's ordained. That's all right. Our pastors are ordained. And, uh, but we're not. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You know, I don't even have a certificate on the wall. I don't want one. I've got one, but I don't put it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because that's not where I'm at. See, appointed is a better word for the congregation. I have, who has he chosen? You? Who has he called? You? Who has he saved? You? And he appointed you to go forth and bear fruit. So don't leave it to the leadership of the church or the ordained or the appointed elders or the appointed people who do this and do that. No, we are all appointed of God. Many Christians fail to live the abundant life because they don't work for God or work for God or with God. They only think the ordained. It's you are. You are. Now, there's nothing wrong with having the studies and, and the qualifications as we said earlier. But I want you to know you're all ordained. Yeah. You're all appointed of God. And so, you know, you don't have to go tell people, well, hey, I'm ordained. Because they'll think that, oh, you've been through that and you've been stamped with that. and, and uh, No, just I'm appointed by God. Use the word appointed. That's better. But it didn't fit with touch. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, God has a plan and a purpose and an appointment for everyone. I love the scripture. We, we often quote the scripture, and many of you know it from Jeremiah 29, 11, For I have a plan and a purpose for you, uh, saith the Lord. And uh, let, me, let me read that to you. Because do you know, uh, not many of you might know, that this scripture is spoken over Israel. And they're in, they're in exile in Babylon. And, and Daniel... Is, is reading the book of Jeremiah at this stage. And so in verse, in verse, uh, in verse 10 it says, uh, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years that completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So Daniel read this and he was in Babylon for 70 years and uh, he said, hey, where are you supposed to be here for 70 years? So then... He, the next verse says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. He's talking to Israel, but God is no respecter of persons, amen. And you was in bondage long enough. And you've come out because God has got a plan and a purpose for your life. And he's got a task for you to perform. And because you're working with the Lord and for the Lord. We're heirs and joint heirs. Amen. We're Christ. And uh, we, we serve the Lord, but He gives us things to do. There's no end of things that you can do and you're appointed to do. If he, let me read from Ephesians 3.16. Do a study of all the 3.16s in your Bible. You'll be amazed. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. And because uh, those He appoints, He anoints. So don't think that you can't do whatever God has called you to do. Because if God calls you to do it, he's appointed you to do it. He will supply what you need to do it. And it says it right here in Ephesians 3.16. And 14 says, for this reason, Paul says, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Right? So Paul saying, I'm praying. That's what he means when he bows the knee. That he would grant you... He's, talking to the, he's writing to the church now. So you as a church can take this for yourself. He's writing to the church that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So this is what God, this is what Paul is praying for the church. This is what you are receiving because God fills you with might in the inner man by the Holy Spirit. He, that's, he anoints you to do what he's called you to do. Oh, well, I don't know whether I can do that. That's what Moses said. Oh, like, I don't speak very well. 
Had God ever used that man, he should have slapped him and put him to one side and used somebody else. But if he did it to him, he'd probably do it to me. Because I've made enough excuses as well. And you've made enough excuses as well. But, Mo, but he said to Moses, go on, I'll come with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. You'll be with us. Amen. So he's appointed us and ordained us to serve him through the touch of God. Remember, see how he touched their lives. And Paul said that God has given you in your inner man. He's touched your life. Number three, you. And this is a powerful one. And it, it's about unity. The touch of God brings unity to our lives. Psalm 133 verse 1. And this scripture came out in our prayer meeting yesterday. How good it is for brethren to dwell in unity. I want to read the whole psalm. Psalm 133. It's only three verses. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on, his, on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. He's talking about unity, people of God. Listen to the last verse. For there the Lord commands the blessing life forevermore. This is what unity does in the church. It brings salvation to the house. Amen. His touch will cause you to cease being a lone ranger. There's many of those in the churches. See, there's no such thing as a stay-at-home Christian. Amen. You know, we have stay-at-home dads now and stay-at-home mums and stay-at-home this and stay-at-home that. Work from home. That don't work in the Christian faith. There's no such thing as a stay-at-home Christian. Now, yeah, you know, you won't lose your salvation if you don't come to church once or twice. Three times, four times, no. <laughs> Behave yourself, Pastor. Ephesians. <laughs> oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Let me tell you a story. I was, I was in India. And some of you have heard this story, but... I don't care, I'm telling that again. <laughs> and, uh, and in Kerala, in a place called Mundakayan, there's a translated Tiger Mountain. And we was visiting homes, and our pastor said, uh, I want our pastor there in the, in the area. He said, I want to take you somewhere and show you something. I said, okay, let's go. And so we went, and we went to visit this old lady. And she was in their church. And so... I said, yeah, okay, so what's the story? He said, when we first, we was doing door to door, when we first came here, we knocked on her door and she shouted hello sort of thing. And she couldn't get out of bed to come. She was a stay-at-home Hindu at the time. She couldn't, she was paralyzed. She couldn't get out. So she couldn't come to the door. So, but the door was always open. So they went in and they talked to her and they told her about Jesus. And she received Christ as her savior. And there was something amazing there. They're very blessed in their evangelism. And so then they said, you know, we have a church. And she said, well, I can't come because I can't get out of the house. And uh, so they said, well, we can fix that. So we'll pray for you. You'll be healed. Then you can come to church. And so she said, great, wonderful, because I'm a stay-at-home. I was a stay-at-home Hindu. Now I'm a stay-at-home Christian. And uh, so they prayed for her, but nothing happened. So, they, so my pastor yeah, there, he's, he's an amazing man, and he wouldn't take sort of no for an answer because he knows the word of God. And if we pray for the sick, they should be healed. And so they pray again, nothing happens. They pray again, nothing happens. So they go outside. He, he walks outside, and he talks to God. So what's the issue here, Lord? And he says, it's a curse. Break the curse. So they go in, break the curse, nothing happens. So... Remember, she's staying at home. So he goes back out and he's getting annoyed with God now. Okay, you told me to break the curse. I broke the curse. Nothing happened. Why is this woman not healed? I'm not leaving here until this woman gets up, until she's healed. And uh, so God said to him, check the door frame. <coughs> Some of you know the story there. Check the door frame. So he goes, what? Like he looked at the door frame. What do you mean, Lord? What do you want me to do? The curse is in the door frame. 
I, I'm like, so they're all laughing and telling me the story. And so he gets a machete and he starts hacking into the door frame. Now, if Pastor Jane come round yours with a machete, don't, leave, don't let her near the door frame, right? She's looking for something. So, come to church. Yeah, you can't be a stay-at-home Christian. I'm going, to find, I'm going to find the reason why you're not coming to church. So, so they hack the door frame open, and in the door frame, she finds, he finds a bone with some hair inside the door frame. There's been, like, they put it in there when they built the place. And so he takes that out, throws it away, put the curse on that instead of the curse that's on the horn, go in, pray for the lady, she gets up. And she's totally healed. And she's totally healed. So now, she no longer a stay at home, she's a coming to church Christian. And some of you people who you know, Christians who stay home, you need to go home and chop into their door frames and break the curse. Break the curse, I mean. I don't know why I told you that. Oh, that Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, He makes us sit together. Amen. Why does He make us sit together? Because oh, left to our own devices, we wouldn't. Yeah. We wouldn't. Many churches fail because members do not work together. They're divided. Divided. They pull in different directions. See, there can only be one vision in the church. Many aspects of that vision, sure. But where there's more than one vision, there's division. All right? The word by and the word die means the same. Two. Okay? And when you can't have two visions, because you'll have a split. You'll have a split. And so there's one vision in God. Amen? And that's Jesus Christ. He's our vision. See, I was looking up that word die. You love this, Ken. And uh, die in the chemistry means two, two, something that's made of two atoms, right? Got it. Like, yeah. So die something is, yeah. Got it? It means you're split. You're, there's a division. And so we only want one vision. There's one Lord, one God, one baptism, one Holy Ghost, one Jesus. There's only one God. You can't have two gods, otherwise you wouldn't know which one to listen to. So how does that work in India? There's 333 million gods. And every one of them's got a voice to keep you away from the one true living God. So we, we want the touch of God will bring unity to our life. The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up in due season. You don't have to run around doing your own thing. There's things that you can do. And uh, like Margaret runs a, a ministry in East Africa and other people will do it, like maybe do a prison ministry. When you come into this place, there's one vision. People come in here from other churches and they go, Pastor, we should do this. And I go, why? And they go, well, we used to do this in our old church. And I go, did it work? And they go, yeah, it was amazing. It was brilliant. I said, so why did you leave? When we come here, God has given us a plan and a vision to win the community, to reach out. And so we work together. Amen? Amen. The touch of God brings harmony and love. And I read this from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 in the Amplified Bible. Make every effort. Now, come on, that means you've got to work, right? Make every effort to keep the oneness or the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means each individual working together to make the whole successful. See, this is where fam families, you, you know, you've got to bring people into line. This is the vision of this family. This is what this family does. We go to church. We used to say to our kids, it's, you know, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Now, my son had been away and he came back, but when he came back, he had to come to church. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do. We're not going to compromise on that. Yeah. We're not going to compromise on our family. Now they grow up and they go and do what they want to do. And once they, like, you have to lay the law down. If you live here, you go to church. Yeah. That's what we do. Because we don't want to break the unity. The unity in God. And the touch of God will bring unity to our lives. I mean, where did I go? Okay. Number four, C. And I like this one. What do you reckon it is? Conquerors. 
The touch of God will make you a conqueror. Romans 8.37 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Many Christians give up far too easily. When persecution or rebuke comes, they quit and throw up their hands and go, it's just too hard. You know, I did that once. Somebody came alongside me and put me right according to the truth of the gospel. See, I had some bad teaching in my early days when I first became a Christian. I loved Jesus, but I didn't like his church. I I loved Jesus, right? But I couldn't perform his word. And someone told me, if you have sin in your life, Pastor, you're going to hell. Well, I didn't say Pastor then, but if you have sin in your life, you're going to hell. And I go, well, I repented this morning. What about tomorrow? If you forgot anything, you've got no chance of getting in. (laughs) That's too hard. That's too hard. Like, I'm sure there's hundreds of things I've done in my life that I've forgot. But Jesus forgives me. And so every morning I get up, I don't, I don't pray and ask God for forgiveness now so that I can stay born again. I get up and I pray and I ask God to forgive me of the things that have gone on in my thoughts and my mouth and my life so that I may stay close to Him. That I may feel His touch upon my life. That's why I repent. That's why I'm one the conqueror. And they, fought, and they fail to get that. When people fail to get their own way, they sulk and they display immaturity. Can you imagine going into battle alongside a crybaby? Like, like, I want somebody who's a conqueror. I want someone who's going to watch my back. I want someone who's going to stand with me in, in prayer. I want someone who's going to fight with me and know how to fight, who know how to wield the sword of the Spirit, who know how to hold up the shield of faith. When my faith is down, I want someone to come alongside me and tell us, okay, my faith will cover both of us for now. Amen. I was praying with this bunch of guys on Friday and I thought, whoo, glory to God, I felt safe. You know, they, these were prayer warriors, you know. And I thank God that they weren't crybabies. But we're in a battle every day. We're in a battle every day. We've been learning that through our Bible studies in the last few weeks. The touch of God gives us courage to overcome. Christ gives us the strength to keep going. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, For we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Let me tell you a story from the first book of Samuel. So the book of Samuel in, in chapter 10, go home and you have to read the first book of Samuel. If you've never read the first book of Samuel, go read it. So exciting. And uh, I'll, I'll preach on this again later on, just on Saul. And uh, he is the son of Kish. And, uh, he's, and he goes out and he's looking for donkeys. And I want to preach on this message too. But he's looking for these donkeys and he finds his way to the prophet Samuel. And uh, so there's a whole journey there that I want to preach on. And so Samuel anoints him to be the king. Because Israel have now asked for a king. They have a king. His name is Yahweh. All right. But he's not a king like the other people had. Oh, they've got a king. And there's this old whingy Hebrews and whingy Christians. Oh, it's not fair. They've got that and they've got this. And that church up the road, they actually have one big screen and we've got these two little screens. And the church up the road, they own their own building and they don't have to do pack up and set up. And Well, go join the church up the road then. <laughs> like, if that's what, like, don't compare. Don't stop whinging about things. You know, so... And, and so Samuel, so Israel wants a king and God gives them what they want. And guess what? They get this crazy guy, Saul. And he actually, God knows in advance, so he anoints him king and he comes and he becomes king. Please go home and read this. But there's one scripture I want to read to you. And it says when, they, when he makes Saul, when Samuel comes, he makes Saul king. And these people have never had a king before. Saul is the first king Israel has ever had. They had judges before, sure. And they've always had Yahweh, their God. But now these people, Yahweh's not enough for them anymore. And Christians, God, sometimes is not enough for you. You've got to go out and do this. Do those people have got it and these people have got it. I should be able to do this while those... Are, uh, yeah, they're sinners. And guess what? They're going to hell if they don't re- receive Jesus. Don't go hang out with them. All right? So anyway, he, Samuel says this to the people. This has been the favorite scripture of mine and Jane's for a long time. 
1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25 and 26. Then Samuel explained to the people the behaviour of royalty. These people have never lived under a king before, except for King Yahweh. Okay? These people, and he had to explain to them the behavior of royalty. And he wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his own house. And Saul, King Saul, also went home to Gibeah. And look at this. And valiant men went with him whose hearts were touched by God. See, when God touches your heart, you become brave. You become full of courage. You become... You, you become something else. You're not a, not a sissy anymore. You're not a crybaby anymore. You've got to grow up when God touches your life and start to go into prayer. Oh, I don't, like, I don't really pray that much. Well, you start to pray more. Oh, and I don't really read my Bible. Well, guess what? Grow up and read your Bible. Grow up and pray. And grow up and get some courage. And get some strength. That means... To be a valiant man, they were conquerors, they were brave, they were warriors. Amen? Yeah. And that's what we need in this hour. Yes. And we need to be touched of God and we need to be brave. Amen? To preach the gospel, to share and, and believe what God is saying. And the last one, H, is heal. When the touch of God comes, healing comes. One of my favorite healing scriptures is when... Is, is in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is on preaching a sermon on the man. And it says, at the start of chapter 8, it says, and he came down from the mountain. And the first thing he meets is a leper. Is a leper. Amen. And the leper says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Yes. And Jesus put forth his hand, verse 3. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be cleansed. <laughs> See, many have never experienced divine healing. And there's a myriad of reasons why. Yeah. Right? Maybe lack of faith, not asking, unbelief. But we need to use our faith that God has given us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, and to each one is given a measure of faith. And we need to grow that faith. For without faith, Hebrews 11 says, it's impossible to please God. The touch of God brings physical, emotional, financial, relational, mental, and spiritual healing. And we receive God's touch in a few different ways. Number one, through the Word of God. Through praying through believing, through accepting what we've read and through obedience to what we've read. Amen. That's how God touches our life and we need to believe it and receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The touch of God is necessary for salvation, but then for everything else, everything we put our hands to. God has touched our lives, but he wants to continue to touch us Continue to anoint us for his service. And Jesus put forth his hand and said, Be healed, or I am willing. Touched the leper and he said, I am willing. And I want to tell you, he was will he's just as willing today as he was 2,000 years ago to reach out and touch your life for whatever issue you have. Ask him. See, the leper came to him. I wonder if Jesus, like, because Jesus knows everything, right? And it's pretty hard to imagine, but because we don't. And he's coming down the mountain and he's thinking, I know who's waiting for me. But he still came to him. The leper still came to him and asked God, who is Jesus Christ, to heal him. I love blind Bartimaeus. When he comes to Jesus, he shared out, and Jesus said, Here, come. And he goes, what do you want me to do? That just seems stupid to me. Yeah. Like, the guy's blind. Yeah. What do you want me to do? Oh, I just need lunch. <laughs> I need to see. Mm. And Jesus touched him and opened his eyes. See, we still need to ask. Pride will stop you asking. Mm. He is willing today. 
and he will touch you to be transformed, to be ordained, to be unified, to be a conqueror, and to be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Father in heaven, I thank you today that we can call out to you, not to a pastor, yes. not to another believer, because we share and you do use us to pray for people, that's for sure. But Lord, you're the one. You're the one who does it. You're the one who touches. And so I thank you, my God, right today, that every person in this place that will reach out to you and ask you for a touch, Lord, that you would transform their lives. You would appoint them, ordain them to go and work for you. Lord, you would bring unity into their hearts. Lord, that they would no longer be the Lone Ranger, but they would come into the body of Christ and be a part of the body as Paul wrote about. Because the body has many parts, but these parts has one body. We thank you, my God, that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And we are healed in your name. 